Welcome to the continuously bootstrapping an indie studio talk, Remaining Agile with Unity. My name is Alex Schwartz. And mine is Devin Reimer. And I am the chief scientist at Alchemy Labs. Uh, this is a photo of our labs right here. Uh, my name is Devin Reimer, as I said, and I'm the founder of Almost Logical Software. So today, uh, among other things, we'll be talking about a recent collaboration that uh, Devin and my company worked on together. The game was called Jack Lumber. And uh, we're going to show you the trailer right now just so you can kind of get a feel for how the, uh, the game plays out. Hey, Billy, do you want to explore the great outdoors, save animals, and chop down an entire forest? Uh... Of course you do! Introducing Jack Lumber, new from Alchemy Labs. He slices, he dices, he cuts logs of all shapes and sizes. It's Jack Lumber. Jack has the power to slow down time and split logs like a champion. Look at that supernatural witcher go. Is that a frozen log from the harsh Canadian tundra? It's not a problem for Jack's magical axe. Yeah, that's the way. Whoa there, fella, that's no log, that's a moose. And we love our creatures of the forest. Uh, why does Jack want to cut down all the trees? Well, Billy, a long time ago, a rotten tree killed his granny and he's out for revenge. Harnessing the power of raw lumberjack emotion, you too can fell all the trees of the forest and clear cut your way to victory. But I love the forest. Shut up, Billy. Jack Lumber, available now. Branching into all of your electronic computing devices today. So there you have it, Jack Lumber, a pun-filled, log-slicing, lumberjack mashup. Uh, and so today, we're going to be talking about making games without going broke. Uh, we have approximately 10 tips for you. So uh, this is basically just our experience in running an indie studio. Um, and mine. Just, yep, in general. So All right, so uh, tip one, building a runway. So I built my runway by working three and a half years as a flash dev at a, a company doing application work. I saved up around $20,000, and then I quit my job to go full-time freelance. Uh, this gave me about six to eight months runway to make sure that I uh, got contract work uh, to keep myself going. Uh, my assumption was that I wouldn't get a lot of game development work out of the gate. Uh, I assumed that I was doing application development and stuff like that for clients. But it turned out that uh, over 90% of my income ended up coming from uh, game development contracts. So over the next two years, I uh, did contract work, and then I built an original IP uh, called Maze Mover. Uh, so Maze Mover is a puzzle sliding game that came out on iPad and uh, Playbook. So uh, my story of uh, building a runway was a bit different. Um, you hear about this all the time now. Uh, typical AAA developer gets sick of the soul-crushing 80-hour uh, weeks, quits his job, and goes indie. That was kind of my path. Uh, so I worked at a studio. We were making 360 and PS3 games. I was a technical artist. Uh, I saved up, um, let's see, saved up 30 grand and formed Alchemy Labs in November 2010 with uh, one co-founder. Uh, and the first thing we did uh, was not do contract work. We went straight into original IP. So our first title was called Snuggle Truck, uh, which you might remember also as Smuggle Truck. Um, here's a picture of the, the snuggly animals flying over a moose. You can see Alchemy Labs uh, very keen on moose. <clears throat> so Snuggle Truck uh, did very well for us, uh, critically acclaimed. We won some awards. Uh, it was a six-month dev cycle released in May 2011. We ended up porting it to, well, it was, it was released on iPhone, iPad, uh, Mac, and PC. We got it on Steam. It was in the Humble Bundle. We did a Linux, a Flash, a BlackBerry, an N, uh, Nokia N9 port. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a great first project for us. After that, uh, we moved on to a half contract, half uh, collaboration with a studio called Deja Bond Games on a game called Ah, which is a base jumping game where you uh, fly down the buildings of futuristic Boston and flip off protesters on your way down into graffiti buildings. So uh, that was also released on PC, Mac, Steam, uh, iPhone, iPad. So uh, tip two is uh, prototyping well. So um, we're going to talk about prototyping uh, with an example of Jack Lumber. 
which we saw up there, uh, which at the point of conception was called Lumber Jerk, and a tree killed your family, not your grandmother, uh, but the basic premise was there from the beginning. So our games, uh, we like to, to start out with a, a really hilarious premise and an idea for uh, a style of game, and then start prototyping and finding fun from there. So the first thing we did is we had our concept artist kind of get rolling on some, some uh, lumberjack concepts, right? So we have our lumberjack there drinking coffee smugly. We have uh, moonshine. We have maple syrup. We have plaid, all the ingredients of a great lumberjack game. And so we started doing some uh, character studies. We have flapjacks here. We have kind of some basic art style forming. Um, you can see we're kind of iterating on the, the character design. Now, at this point, um, the typical indie mistake, make a, a massively overscoped, unattainable project. This game was originally an open world social RPG where you'd command your lumber minions around to chop down trees, gain resources, which are logs, uh, which we later found out is basically Ravenwood Fair. Um, and so moving forward, we, but our big difference was that we'd have an action component in this game, right? Yeah. So you would fell your trees up in step one. You would saw the trunks of the, the trees in step two, and then you'd have a log splitting game, uh, step three. Perfect. Now, at this point, it's, uh, it's, it's good to mention that we had signed up to be part of this, uh, this thing called the Indie Mega Booth at PAX East. So um, we put money down. We, you know, we had floor space. We had no game yet, but hey, we got seven months. We're good to go. We'll have a lumberjack game. So uh, the next logical thing is to make a bunch of hats. So <laughs> we started working on that. <laughs> Applause for hats. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, also, a bunch of axes. You can see our waffle axe here. Uh, we have our chainsaw axe, our axe axe. Um, lots of good stuff. And so we had a pitch, uh, Lumber Jerk. We had this, this game idea, Lumber Jerk. Uh, so yeah, let's start working on it. Wait a minute. Let's, uh, let's actually cut everything in the entire game except this one chunk. So splitting logs on a stump. That was kind of what was compelling to us at the moment. So we said, OK, let's start prototyping that. So. Here's a video of our very first Unity prototype of log splitting. Um, as you can see, you can drag around an ax. Uh, you have your static log, which is just sitting there, and you can chop it. Uh, so at this point, we felt, hey, things are going really well. We're just, just kind of missing that one key element. Let's keep iterating. Uh, and so our next version, obviously, we added a plunger where you can drop logs from the sky and then chop them. Uh, so at least twice as good. Yeah, yep. About 200% productivity here. Um, and so we moved on. By the way, three months until publicly displaying this product, uh, which really we had nothing. Um, so that's always good. So uh, logically, the next step was to add a conveyor belt. Because uh, motion is better. Right. And a bear driving a truck that you could <laughs> throw logs into. You're welcome, internet. <laughs> so um, this idea of kind of blogs piling up on you and throwing them into some bin in the distance uh, seemed really great to us. We were really happy with this concept, but just missing some one little bit. We're not sure what. And I think it's more conveyor belts. Yeah. Because <laughs> more motion means more fun. Right. So at this point, we started thinking of kind of a topple-like stacking game the game at this point is radically shifting. Uh, we're thinking about how, how the hell do we make this fun? Because um, believe it or not, it wasn't fun yet. Right. I don't know if you could tell from the video, but uh, not so much fun. So at this point, uh, a couple of indies elected to go uh, to a cabin in Vermont, uh, kind of as a retreat indie cabin. Um, and so we're sitting by the fire, and uh, all these other indies, which I respect, uh, I had my iPad, and I was showing them you know, the Jack Lumber, this game I was working on. And they all looked at me and said, dude, I'm, I'm your friend, but this is just horrible. Like, what, what is this? Um, and so a moment of reflection in front of the fireplace. Uh, thankfully, my friend Aaron said, you know, you have this character, this wonderful story and premise, but he's not really, he's just chopping logs. What would a supernatural lumberjack do? Right there, we had the idea of stopping time, right? He would obviously be in the matrix, and he would stop time and cut logs in the air magically. Uh, so I, you know, I called you up and I said, "This is what we're, this is what we're going to try it." So we prototyped uh, that game. Oh, by the way, two months until we have to show this thing to 60,000 people. Uh, so in six days, we came up with this prototype in Unity. 
and you can see I'm just doing a quick video. Um, we have pretty much everything from the final core gameplay of Jack Lumber. So we have stopping time with your finger. We have the idea of logs that you have to cut down the grain. We have um, certain logs that are one directional, multi-cut logs. Um, pretty much everything had a, a really rough first pass at this point. Yep, com uh, combo system, the blams, the explosions, the tosses. Um, and so it's worth mentioning that this was, uh, what, six days worth of work, but six months worth of waffling <laughs> and iteration. Also, our cats <laughs> seem to really like it, so yes. <laughs> um, Yeah, so the, uh, well, the last bit there is that uh, we showed it to these same people, and it was universally, everyone was having fun with the prototype. So there it was. Found we finally fun. found fun. Yeah. So to wrap this part up, we kind of have a rule where you need to develop a prototype in less than seven days. So I'm not saying the process needs to take less than seven days, because it clearly took us much longer than that. But the actual code and project you're writing needs to take less than seven days. And the reason for this is one of my rules of thumb. For every day you take developing a prototype, it takes about a month to polish that. And so that has been kind of consistent across all my projects. So this one took about seven, six, seven days. It took about six, seven months to polish it. Right. And we both kind of knew this for a while, yet we were working on those stupid conveyor belt prototypes for, you know. Yeah, too long. <laughs> way too long. <laughs> that was almost fun. So. I know. Yeah, don't. Uh, don't worry about just throwing everything out and just starting again. I think one more conveyor belt would have done it. Yeah, it's like upside down inverted. Uh, so tip three, bang for your buck. So uh, the first thing, so you're limited on cash as an indie startup. You know, you have your runway. You want to uh, keep it going as long as possible. Um, we work with a couple of rev share partners on our, on our projects. Um, so the thing is, find rev share partners. It's extremely hard to find people who are kind of at a point where they can contribute without upfront money. Uh, it also takes a lot of time uh, as a company to establish enough trust and to, to establish that you're reliable enough that you will ship this game, because everything's contingent on actually shipping. So uh, to, you know, that's one big thing. But the, the pluses are you get talent that you wouldn't normally be able to afford, and you also get people who are wildly committed to the success of the product. So um, always pluses there. But Rev share or not, um, we work with a lot of people. We have employees, we have contractors, we have rev share partners. Uh, just in general, um, it's not worth the time and the effort and the pain of working with people who are not A plus devs. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to find the best people. Um, we use game jams as kind of one of our hiring techniques at Alchemy. Um, it's a good place to kind of see someone under pressure, under time commitment. Uh, see what they can crank out. It kind of gets a good rating on their GSD, which I, I like to call, I like kind of rate people on GSD. It's a uh, get shit done ratio. So uh, you could find that out pretty quick at a game jam. So uh, another good way to get bang for your buck is to use a good engine. Uh, so that's why we use Unity. So I believe your time is much better spent actually building and polishing a game opposed to building tech. It also gives you the benefit of easily ramping up new people. If someone's used the engine before, they're uh, much quicker at being able to jump in and actually get some work done. It allows you to also move between projects more quickly. So if you build your own tech and you build a custom 3D engine, and then the next game you decide, oh, I'm building a 2D game, and you go and rewrite a new engine, you have all this code that can't be ported. If you work with a single good engine, you can move that code between projects. And lastly, uh, Unity has a wonderful asset store uh, that we go and use a lot because it has a lot of awesome available tools. So this moves me into uh, tip four, build game, not tech. Writing everything yourself is a trap. And unfortunately, I see lots of people fall into this trap. Now, why is reinventing the wheel a trap? The reason is, is that getting about 75% of what you need done is cheap and quick. It's that last bit that is super expensive and time consuming. I know numerous people who've went and, oh, I'm going to build my own engine or build my own huge thing that's already been done before. And then they come up to me in three weeks and go, look at this, we're almost done. And then five months later, they're like, OK, we scrapped it. We're now going with Unity. <laughs> so what are some of the tools that we use? Uh, so, of course, Unity uh, in Jack Lumber, we use 2D Toolkit. 
Uh, we use Prime 31 everything, uh, multi-platform toolkit, and uh, play mode persist. Right. And uh, Vectrosity for the line drawing. Yes. I, don't, I don't know if Eric's here, but Vectrosity. <laughs> yeah, and there's lots of other tools that we use. Yeah. So, well, that being said, this, the, the section here is uh, build games, not tech. Uh, both of us have created uh, you know, things that we're selling on the asset store currently. So in my case, uh, multi-platform toolkit um, with Yilmaz, the, the whole point there was that we built it for the project we were building at the moment. We didn't say, hey, what's a good tool we should make? So we already had something. We just spent some time after the project polishing it up. Yeah, and same with Play Mode Persist. There was, uh, I was really annoyed that I couldn't change things while I'm in Play Mode and have it all save. And I was like, I'm just going to build something to save myself time. And maybe this is something also good to sell on the asset store. Yep. All right. Uh, tip number five, actually market your game. Uh, it's sad that th this has to be a section, but people are uh, extremely bad at realizing that they need to market their game, we feel. So um, to kind of continue along with this story of Jack Lumber, we're finishing, we had our prototype, uh, and so we needed to get a vertical slice for PAX. So uh, what we did is we went to PAX East and we dressed up as lumberjacks. So this was um, kind of our thing at the Indie Mega Booth. We had, uh, we had flannel and plaid and axes. Um, here's Jason De La Roca getting the high score on the game. Uh, here's everyone wearing plaid as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's uh, some really excited people playing the game. Hey, don't look too bored over there. <laughs> Here's us doing a jig. Uh, and yeah, so PAX East. So people ask us all the time, is it worth it going to conferences? And so just a little aside here, uh, we got three major things, and it does have to kind of do with this marketing aspect uh, out of going to PAX. Number one, we found our voice. So here are some pins we gave out at PAX. Uh, we have our hatetrees.com domain, which points to Jack Lumber, uh, suckattrees, and fucktrees.com. And so uh, day one, we gave out hate trees, or yeah, hate trees. And uh, the, the 200 or 100 that we printed up went in about two hours. Uh, day two, we did fuck trees. They were gone in 10 minutes. So we found out that people really started embracing this idea of kind of, you know, trees suck, uh, Jack Lumber, you know, a tree killed his grandma, fuck trees. And like, it was, it was a great kind of uh, way to explain the game and, and uh, find that humor. And so when Arbor Day came around, we sent out a mailer to all of our press and game developer friends. It says, last year, Arbor Day volunteers planted over 8 million trees. Jack says, I've got my work cut out for me. So um, the second thing we got out of going to PAX was um, basically our press sheet, right? So people loved uh, Jack Lumber. Uh, Touch Arcade said, absurd is the right word for this. We're hopelessly stoked to see it in motion. Uh, Steven Totila from Kotaku said, I'm sold. Uh, game Zebo said, let's face it, trees suck. So. Um, yeah, we really uh, did a great job. Like the press did a great job of kind of figuring out our our style and and writing about that in a, in a great way. And plus, we gave them a lot of pun opportunities, and they love that, so they can do crazy headlines about logs and timber. Um, some more tweets about the game. Uh, Susan from Escapist saying she dug the game. Um, Ryan Davis from uh, Giant Bomb. So that was actually, uh, Ryan was one of our biggest fans. We ended up stumbling upon him. You could tell. Yeah, so after PAX, we ended up going to this bar and accidentally ended up crashing the giant bomb after party and not knowing it. And then I looked down, and then Ryan Davis was sitting there, and I said, you want to play a game about a supernatural lumberjack? And he said, yes. <laughs> and so then he's like, I hate trees. And yeah. so, yeah, he just loved the game so much. Uh, and the third thing we got out of PAX was um, a, a lot of beta testing, right? So there's a lot of people there, a lot of people playing your game. Uh, and it's not just technical fixes that you're finding. We found out um, the direction to continue moving in the development of our, of our game. We found where the sticky points were with regard to kind of uh, user experience, and, and uh, that kind of informed the rest of our development process going to PAX. Uh, and while we were there, um, you know, we're doing our thing. We're planning on self-publishing, but other people were watching. Uh, we were approached by a bunch of publishers, um, one of which was Sega. And so we had some basic rules uh, that, we, you know, we, we said, we're planning on self-publishing. We have a couple kind of core ideals. We want to keep our IP. We want full attribution that we made this game. Uh, we want to stick 100% with creative control on us. Uh, we don't want someone coming in and say, hey, can you uh, make a small change with those logs, maybe switch them to, uh, you know, boats? Boats. That, that wouldn't be cool. So um, working with Sega has been really, really great. They've uh, 
kind of understood the process of, of a uh, you know, development, de development team and, and kind of gone along with all these ideals of ours. And so uh, we ended up being this, the first um, Sega Alliance title, which is their mobile publishing unit now. Uh, so Jack Lumber just launched um, seven days ago. And so Sega you know, is right there in the, the intro title screen, which is great. So now on to some uh, scary app uh, store numbers. So this is great uh, infogram from Ars Technica. So it's got a, a lot of interesting facts on here. Uh, the main one that I latched on to uh, is that uh, the top 12% earn $50,000 or more, and they're considered top earners. But meanwhile, of the top earners, they spend $30,000 on average on marketing on a game. But yet, you look over here in the middle, and 52% of app developers spend $0 on marketing. So that seems to be a huge problem. So when it came to Jack Lumber, when we ended up adding everything up, of money spent on the game, we ended up spending over 50% of our money on marketing alone. So to segue into our next piece, if you look in the middle, 80% of people are not able to support a standalone business with app development. So it leads me into tip six, cycles. So why we lo both love doing original IP, it has a lot of upsides. So the upsides are the joy of creating something new. You actually own the IP. You have the highest chance of making large profits. And you uh, give great visibility to yourself and your company. But it's not without its problems. Its main problem is it has the lowest chance of profitability, meaning that you could go bust. So how do we deal with this? And we deal with this by using contract work and working in cycles. So what are the upside of contract work? So the upside is guaranteed income. But it has some downsides. Uh, the downsides are you don't own the IP. Uh, you have no chance of high profitability, and sometimes you can't even show your work publicly. But as you noticed, those points are counter to each other, so they actually work as great complements. So this leads us into what uh, Alex and I did independently and uh, both agree on, and then working together, it's been great because we've been following this philosophy. It's the 50-50 cycle. So, so we do six months of original IP followed by six months of contract work. Uh, what we see fail a lot is a lot of people work on original IP and it's contract work come in and then they're like, okay, we're putting this on the back burners. We do some contract work and then they go back to it a bit and then contract work. And the problem is that contract work always is money now and original IP is money later. So it's a lot easier to just fall back on contract work and never get any original IP done. Mm -hmm. So what we do is when we're working on original IP, we're working on that and then once we're done, then you move on to contract work. Right. But there's also another negative of splitting your time is that no one is 100% fully focused on one thing. And I think the best creative juices come out when you're working on one single title and you can really own that. Yeah, and so for fans of Breaking Bad, when I was looking for images of this, I found this sweet one. And then I realized that uh, for people who watch the show, Walt also works in cycles because the first six months he was doing his original thing and then he did six months of contract work and then six <laughs> months of original stuff again. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, here's the fun part of doing this, this cycle thing is that uh, crunch on your original IP is landing or is happening right as you're signing contracts on the next uh, contract. So that's, that's no fun. And uh, you want to you kill yourself right at that merging point. So yeah. we haven't figured that out. Uh, so if someone wants to come by and tell us a solution to that, uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so tip number seven, uh, diversifying income. This is kind of uh, how Alchemy Labs is not broke. Game dev is really risky, uh, and we needed a long-term game plan. So um, here's, here's kind of an anecdote before I get into how we do this. Uh, how much money did Jack Lumber need to make to prevent Alchemy Labs from going broke? And, and almost logical software, too. So. Yep, same. <laughs> right? Zero dollars. <laughs> we needed to assume that our original IP made zero dollars in order to make sure that a flop doesn't mean that our whole company goes out of business. So diversifying our revenue streams, right? So every month, Alchemy Labs gets drip income from the following locations, right? So we have two games on Steam. Um, we have 
two games on the App Store. Uh, we have Union, which Snuggle Truck was part of Union, uh, so we get checks from them. Uh, Snuggle Truck is on Google Play, uh, so Android. Snuggle Truck was in the Humble Bundle, and so that's not really drip income. It kind of was just one check. Uh, but then also the Unity Asset Store, right? So when you're uh, doing your original IP, that's coming in every month. That's paying for our employees. This is really important stuff. If we hadn't made these tools, or we hadn't worked on AWB, uh, which is giving us rev share, or we hadn't done an Android port, our monthly income, when we're not actually you know, shipping and launching a game and you get a big spike, would be so low that we, you know, we would risk having to possibly fire someone at some point, because it's, it, you know, it's, it's a big uh, roller coaster. Yeah. But this helps keep it much flatter. Uh, yeah, more and predictable. And so for uh, multiple points uh, throughout game development, the asset store actually made each of us more money than anything else we were doing. Yep, yeah. Th there have been months where the asset store has, has been the bigger, biggest check, which is kind of cool. Um, and then... So yeah, your uh, contract work should try to span six months. So if it's one six-month contract or uh, six one-month contracts, but when you're deciding how much you need to make, you should be able to make sure that you're making a year's worth of salary off that six months, because then that allows you to do six months of original work and not go broke. So tip eight, actually getting contracts. Uh, so here's some, uh, here's some things that I found uh, <laughs> get you some good contracts. So as an example, last year we bumped into somebody named Devin Horseman. Yeah, front there here. He is, yeah. uh, and uh, he made an impression on us for knowing a lot about shaders. He actually programmed us a shader while walking to a bar. Uh, so this goes to getting known for something really specific. And so because he was in our mind, we ended up needing a particular thing done on Jack Lumber, so we contacted him and his company did some work for us. As another example, around Christmas time, uh, Unity had a contest called Flash in a Flash. And so what they were doing was uh, offering prizes for people that were building content in Unity that was published through the Flash exporter. And so what I did at that point was I dropped everything that I was doing and just spent a couple weeks just trying it out and seeing what I can do, poured it over some uh, content, and put a whole bunch of stuff up on my blog. And, and he was a Flash developer for, what, t uh, seven years? Seven years before that, so. So yeah, so I had a lot of knowledge there, and I thought, I might as well use it. And so I did that, and it was fun. And about a month later, uh, Unity actually contacted me and said, we want you to do some work, because they had seen what I was doing. Well, and well, the, the title of the talk is uh, <clears throat> Remaining Agile as Indie Developers, right? So the fact that we were able to drop everything we were doing over Christmas, I ported AWE to Flash and then got second place and a free iPad and a license for Unity and a check. Like, it, <clears throat> it was really good to just, just be like, hey, let's, let's do this and, and spend Christmas instead of with our families coding <laughs> some, hacking through the code base uh, for Flash export. That was pretty good. So yeah, that brings me to the networking like mad. So go out and meet people. Conferences are incredibly important. So uh, I had this rule when I went freelance that uh, I was only allowed to continue to go to conferences as long as the people I met there gave me contracts that actually paid for the conferences. And so the first conference I went to, it took 11 and a half months. And then I made that money back from people I met there. So I could go to the next one. And then the next one, it was three weeks. So the turnaround time got it much shorter because it's actually interacting with people face-to-face uh, -face that's so important. And somebody always knows somebody. So if you make an impression on one person, they will tell another person. And lastly here, I think Twitter is extremely important. I checked the last 12 months, over 40% of my contract work, initial touch, came through Twitter. An example, the Unity one, the, the way they contacted me was via Twitter. And so, yeah, just be active in the community. Yep. Um, and, you know, the people you meet through these conferences, uh, they not only are your support network and suppliers of contracts, they end up being, you know, future collaborators and possibly future employees. Uh, and so tip number 10 is always ask questions at the end of presentations. So that's what we have for you guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our presentation. And questions. So questions?
We also have some prepared questions uh, and answers. Let's get it. Let's do one. Yeah, let's just, one. We'll hold it. We'll, we'll put it up there, and then we'll see if any of those kind of spark some interest. <laughs> okay. Twitter uh, accounts, but uh, I saw them on the previous. Yes. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> there we go. Um, what kind of trees do you hate the most and why? <laughs> the ones that kill family members really just kind of <laughs> rub me the wrong way. Devin, any? Birch. Birch. Hi. Uh, we were wondering uh, what you just said about conferences being really important uh, to get to meet people for contracts possible. Uh, that's exactly the reason why we are here at the moment, uh, but we find it quite difficult to find people actually looking uh, to have a game built or uh, something in that area, because, well, 95% are like us, building games, instead of, uh, you know, people searching for games. Yeah, so... Well, the people building games also need other people to come in at certain times, so it, all devs usually need kind of like an a emergency line Yeah, and so point. that's like, uh, something that I, when about six years ago when I started attending conferences, I would like go to people and try to find work actively at conferences, and that never works, like almost never. Um, what I find is actually making impressions on people. It's the six months down the line when they are looking for somebody, your, your name will come up then, and then that's the key. So yeah, don't get too discouraged. You're like, I didn't find anything right now. Uh, just make sure you make lots of impressions and go for right. drinks with people. That's great. Right, and well, depth knowledge of one thing, right? So if yeah. you're known for a certain element, then that's kind of that keyword will spark the memory in you know, someone who needs you in the future. Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, just a quick question about your partnership with Sega. Uh, you went into a lot about like you know retaining your own control and things like that, but uh, what did Sega do for you? Was it just marketing or yeah, it was, know, a, it was it was a straight do? up marketing deal. Uh, since we had built the entire game uh, ourselves, funded the game ourselves, we're ready to publish it ourselves. We had our trailer, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we basically we worked with Sega to get uh, you know a bigger blast on on launch day, um, better reach, and some you know some cross promotion and other things. In, in your view, what are the top five conferences to go to for indie developers? Well, Unite. Um, yeah. Definitely GDC. I mean, that's, that's got to be. Yeah. Uh, I had, I've had some success with uh, Flash in the Can, uh, FITC now. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, E3 was probably the worst for me. That was, uh, I was there with a, uh, another company in the past, and it just didn't have the vibe of kind of developers connecting on a level where contracts and, and meeting people was, you know, efficient. Uh, it, the PAX is definitely, but they're consumer-facing conferences. And there, there are still devs there, so if you're demoing or, or going to, you know, developer meetups, then, then that works. But yeah. just remember that, yeah, PAX is kind of like anime conferences and things like that. It's, it's all consumer-facing. Yeah, unless you know somebody maybe working on a game, like because there's a lot of indie stuff goes there, and you can hang around with them, um, that works then too. Yeah. That's actually, I mean, that's a good question for people in the audience is kind of like where, which conferences have given you good uh, amounts of contract work or good connections? Elliot, I know you go to like 20 conferences a year, but you know, what's your, what's your best moneymaker conference? Unite and GDC, I would say. Yeah. Uh, hi. Could you tell us a, li a little bit about your strategy when you publish on the App Store and Google Play? Well, um, well so in general, Alchemy Labs, my company, we try to uh, create games that are remarkable in the sense that people will want to remark about the game and how absurd or silly it is. So we're in that you know, Adult Swim style niche uh, where people see the game or just hear the premise of the game and they're already telling someone about it. They haven't even played it yet. So that's kind of one of our um, core focuses and, and kind of a marketing strategy from the beginning is that you know, we can't just make something bland. We have to make something that is really notable. Um, but as far as kind of the, the technical aspect of you know, what, how do you get noticed on the App Store, it's, I mean, you could talk about that for weeks on end and then still be wrong. It's really, really tough. Uh, it changes every day. Um, 
I, yeah. I think all you can do is just try to do as much marketing and build the best game as possible, give it as good of a push as you can. Yeah. Um, being a student, it's pretty hard to actually try and score a job, so what can I do as a student to uh, make my impression much stronger? I think it's, it's the same as, as you were saying about getting contracts, is that you don't go up to someone and be like, hey, do you need a contract? You're like, do you need someone to help contract? Or, hey, I need a job. That's kind of the cardinal sin of networking, right? Like, if you're talking to someone, make a great impression with them, talk to them, make them think, hey, this guy is really smart. Uh, and then, you know, maybe later on you follow up through email once you kind of get their contact info and say, hey, if you're, if you're looking for anybody, I'm available. But uh, I think that turns a lot of people off um, if you try to kind of upfront lay out what you're trying to do. You just kind of want to meet cool people and, and show that you know, you know your shit. Yeah, what I found uh, when I was a student was writing my own blog was hugely beneficial. It's really time consuming, but I would focus on particular areas and then people would know me for that. Yep. It makes conferences really awesome when you walk up to somebody you haven't seen before and they actually know your previous work. Yeah. I mean, I get that asked a lot and I don't want to take too much time on it, but the, the basis of kind of uh, having your portfolio be your centerpiece of, of uh, you know, getting in touch with, once you've gotten in touch with someone, that's your one shining thing. You know, the resume is not even as important as the portfolio. People just want to see if you've done good work and, you know, have it shown there. And so a lot of students, they have uh, a really wide breadth of what they're doing. You know, if you see an environment artist with a web design category, you're already off to a bad start. You need to show that you're, you're really good at one thing and showing everything that you do doesn't help. Oh, here's the... Uh, the loaded question slide. Is it me? Right. Uh, when you're um, hiring people, um, how do you find out if they're really getting shit done and um, if they're really that good as, um, as they say they are? I don't think there's any way to tell beyond knowing that they're a good person. Just you could talk to them and, and know that they're cool and you can get along with them, but you have to work with them first. So it's just finding ways that you could work with people without too much commitment, right? So if you can contract with them for a couple months, that's a great way to do it. Game jams I mentioned before, good way to work with people. Uh, maybe you end up working with them on some other auxiliary project. I think just being in close contact and working is really the only way in my mind to Yeah, and also building a hire. good network of other people that are also hiring people because uh, they maybe have some knowledge about a person that you don't. Because I, I definitely do contact other people I know to see if they know something about the person. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, it's a small industry. So if someone comes to you, you should be reaching out to kind of an advisor network of people and saying, hey, do you know this guy? Like, did he screw over his, did he burn any bridges? You know, do you work with him? I saw on your LinkedIn, you worked with him. What did, you know, how, how was it? Hi. Uh, I've got two questions. Uh, first is, how do you guys uh, meet each other and start to work with each other? And Should the other one that. is, how many colliders are in a standard Jack Lumber line? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Those are two wonderful questions. Yeah. And we so, really should have put that in the presentation about how yeah, we met, because that was like the entire point of this. The, yeah. Uh, the fact that we met was at a Unite conference. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we, that was in Montreal, I believe. That, yeah, that was the one was that we three, met. And yeah. Ago. So, we hung out for a bit, and then at the following one, we hung out more, and then did a game jam at the end of the conference. That was really yeah. dumb, because we were super tired. But uh, then, then Snuggle Truck, uh, that was the same kind of thing. It's like, we worked with them, or sorry, we, we had the game jam together, and then when uh, we were building Snuggle Truck, we needed someone to do the entire back end uh, server stuff and PHP and, and all that, and we're like, Devin. Yeah, and I, I wasn't even that I presented that I knew had this knowledge. I just presented online that I kind of knew the really good Flash and Unity. But then they had trusted me, so when I said that I could do this, it, it's just what we did. Yep. And so to answer your question... We'll have to double jump. Uh, let's see. Where yeah. are we here? Yeah, right here. Okay, so there's a lot. <laughs> the problem is, is that people have big fingers. And so... Here's a subset of all the logs, and these are all the interpenetrating colliders that are everywhere. Um, is it, do I have another one here? Yeah. That shows like the basic log here. Um, so here's the log setup. Around the outside of the log here, uh, there is a collider that's actually your physics collider, because the game is actually physics-based, and so logs will actually hit each other. And then you have, so what, what did I say, seven colliders? So there's an outer one. Uh, that does detection if you're coming close to the log, an inner one, a start, some ends. It's actually quite complicated. Um, 
your previous game, Snuggle Truck, released on a lot of platforms, but I noticed that uh, Jack Lumber was only for uh, uh, iPad and, uh, and an iPhone. Is there a specific reason why you didn't release on other platforms? Um, it was definitely a time constraint. That was one big thing. Um, it takes takes longer to be concurrently developing our Android uh, version. But so at the moment, we're currently looking at you know all the other platforms that are available to us, and we'll be uh, kind of capitalizing on that. Because I mean, with a Unity project just sitting there, it's it's money that hasn't been collected yet. So it would be stupid of us to not port to other platforms in the future. Yeah, but it allowed us to get the game out quicker. Yeah, that's one of those things. Is like you have a non budget non-budging timeline there when you start setting up and working with the next contract. So then you know, we set a date where we're starting this next six-month contract, and now, now our original IP has to finish at this point. Um, and so that's also a good thing is that when you have these crazy deadlines like PAX or you know, an, another contract coming up, it really forces you to put the pedal to the metal on your original IP because that's one of the other big problems with original IP. You never finish them, right? If it's just kind of the side project, it, it'll never get done. And so that forces you to, you have to get it done. So. Hey, guys. Uh, I, I had a question. How, how would you deal with criticism? I can uh, imagine someone just looking at your game without seeing this talk and going, oh, yeah, they saw Fruit Ninja, and Fruit Ninja was very good, and these guys just added a slowdown. <laughs> Right. And now they're trying to make money out of copying someone else's game. How, how do you deal with that kind of criticism? How do you, you know, how can you live with it? It's a, it's a tough process. Um, you know, we, when we were prototyping, we, when we said, hey, if, what if the logs were up in the air and, and kind of, you know, we're cutting down the grain. Uh, there was definitely like, oh, uh oh, you know, that's kind of close to Fruit Ninja. And so we wanted to, every step of the way through development, we wanted to differentiate ourselves, um, both on the development side and then on the press side. So when we were talking with Touch Arcade, which was our first outlet that you know, we did an exclusive release of the information about Jack Lumber uh, on the first day of PAX with, with Touch Arcade. And uh, we worked with Brad Nicholson from Touch Arcade. Uh, and he had, you know, we had demoed personally to him. We explained kind of the, the game because from screenshots, you might get the wrong impression. So it's important to kind of get off to, on the right foot. Uh, and you know, Brad's first write-up on Touch Arcade was, guys, you know, I, I understand that this screenshot might look, you know, like something you've played before, but this game is killer. And, you know, like, he, he repped it for us, and that was kind of the start of our press movement. Uh, so that definitely helped, but, you know, it's going to happen. Um, people are going to see anything moving in a par parabolic trajectory and say, Fruit Ninja. Uh, and if, if anything's ever getting flung, you're screwed, right? That's, that's, it's uh, Angry Birds, no matter what you're doing, it doesn't matter. So um, I think we, we needed to not be afraid of kind of finding fun in the right way, because logs sitting on a conveyor belt was never going to be fun. They had to be in motion. The only way to put them in motion was to kind of have a launching system. And so we went with it. And yeah, and we were, we, I was a little bit worried about it and when we went to PAX, just kind of <laughs> seeing when people like looked at it originally. Um, but what we found was people would come up to it and go, oh, it's Fruit Ninja. And then they play for a moment, this isn't Fruit Ninja. And yeah. so that was, that was really good. I should have probably bleed that into about our tutorial. So yeah. the fact that people, some people thought it was Fruit Ninja as soon as they started playing it acted as a detriment because what they would do is just flail on the screen. Right. And we ended up uh, redoing the tutorial seven times because this is how people is play Fruit Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, our PAX demo, yeah. we had a, a decent amount of trouble uh, because our tutorial wasn't as solid getting people to play it correctly. And it was like, slow down, draw lines, don't right. flail. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely something we needed to be aware of to address. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, can you just uh, please expand on uh, the first initial contacts that you had with Sega and how that went um, for you guys to work to together with them? Uh, well, the game's been out for seven days, so we don't really have that much data. Uh, so it's not much numbers to talk about. With or, the initial contact with Sega. Right, how did like, the, how did we get in touch? Yeah. Um, it was actually at PAX, two PAXs ago when we were showing Snuggle Truck. They came up, gave us their card, they said, nice game. That was it. Didn't really follow up. Um, the PAX after where we were showing Jack Lumber, uh, same guy, Ethan Einhorn, the guy who we're working with now currently at, the, uh, at Sega, came up and said, you know, hey, I, 
this game is awesome. We love it. Uh, you know, we want to talk to you after this. And so, uh, you know, we just started with a Skype call and uh, went from there. Uh, we, had, uh, we had good, you know, bargaining leverage in the sense that we had this game completely on our own. We had paid for the entire thing, and we were ready to self-publish, right? So, I mean, the, the great rule of contracts is you have to be able to walk away. And we weren't in a position where we would be screwed if we walked away. So it was a, uh, it was a good, you know, standing there. But they, they were great. They didn't try to screw us in any way. Uh, the contract was extremely, uh, you know, yeah, it whatever, awesome. whatever you want to call it, like it, it respected us and it didn't try to sneak anything in. It was, uh, it was, a, it was a good process going. And at the time, we were reading a lot of contracts, so that was a little bit of a breath of fresh air. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering if you could uh, talk about your process regarding the default time scale. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. I'll go back a bunch. Okay. Well, I wouldn't really call it a process. Uh, I would call it one of our biggest mistakes in development. Uh, so while we were prototyping the game and all those, you know, um, the, oh, the first version where the logs were tossed up, it was kind of um, the logs were moving too fast. So someone set the time scale to 0.4. Possibly me, uh, and that was great, you know. And we moved forward. And uh, by the way, ditch your prototypes after you're done when you start working on your uh, production code. Just, just scrap throw it, it out. Just throw the whole thing out. That didn't happen with this one particular thing. So uh, it stayed at 0.4 as our default game time scale, and it was too late to change it. By the time we had already had a level designer creating levels that all reacted to that time scale, and everything was kind of based off that. And so when you're in lumber time, when you know, stop time, uh, time scale turns to actually 0.02. And then you, you divide out the, uh, the physics delta time from that time scale, and uh, everything works like that. So the problem is particle system in Unity, animation system in Unity, uh, lerps and tweens by default, the physics system, and w like using wait for seconds, none of that is time scale independent. So when you say wait for seconds two, but you're in 0.02 time scale, it's five minutes, right? Uh, so you're we had waiting to, a while. <laughs> yeah. So we had to write all of our own uh, systems to handle the, the weird time scales. So when we wanted something to add force, we would have to completely, you know, iTween has the, uh, um, what is it, like ignore time scale bool, which is it's great, but uh, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, really weird stuff, especially when you're checking delta times and you're in the middle, because it doesn't just go from 0.02 back up to 0.4. It actually like, tweens yeah. between. So we, every we lerp our while. time. So uh, and it, so like you do a particle system, you do some flame, like the f fire on your finger as you cut a fire log. You make it look amazing, and it's yay done. And you put it in the game, and then it's going. <laughs> Because you realize that you did it, uh, the particle system editor is running at 1.0, your 0.4 in uh, regular time, and then your 0.02 in lumber time. <laughs> so, and and to, to top it off, we have real time, menu time, game time, and lumber time, which are all our system time systems in the game, uh, which really really messes with your mind. Yeah, and you have to make sure you reset the time when you load a different scene, because all of a sudden we had one button that would go back to the cabin, but now the cabin's in point oh two time, and or you pause the game and then you hit back to cabin, and then all the animals are moving at like really slowly. You're like, what happened? Oh, so yeah, that's all of our canned questions. Man, oh, this one. Um, so going to someone and saying. Uh, hey, I would like to work for you for this job. That sounds like a bad move because it's really awkward, but what about the other way around? Like, you want to try and recruit people. Uh, what would be the best approach for that? Um, talk to them. Uh, try to get to know them. Well, my, uh, my favorite is actually having a drink with them. Uh, get to lot, know a lot about people once they've had a few drinks. Yeah. Um, and get their card so you remember in the morning. Or write some interesting details about them on the yeah. back of the card. Yeah, you know. I don't think there's anything specific about hiring. I mean, hiring is one of the hardest things to do. Um, and it, it takes a long time, and it takes a lot out of you. And finding the right people is extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, it's just, always it's just hire people always smarter than you. Yeah. Yeah. And do everything yourself until you can't do it anymore, and then get someone to take that. that that's when you know you need to hire someone. It's like you're, you're about to kill yourself because you have so much work. 
and uh, I shouldn't be doing sysadmin anymore, you know, and then hire a sysadmin. So I think we're done. I think we are. Thank you. <laughs>